Previously, we were left with checking whether our map corresponds to the map of a machine. We could solve this with the extensional machine that checks whether two machines have an equal map. In this way, we could finally eliminate mental demons. But what does it mean for two things to be equal? Chapter 5. Equality. This question is so loaded that Heraclitus answers this with a simple nothing. No man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. Embrace chaos, embrace demons, I know that I know nothing. Please demon, leave me alone. Fear not, Leibniz the Demon Slayer says, for I have the law of indiscernibles. Two things are equal if they share the same properties, and thus, two formal maps are equal, exactly if they accept and reject the same sequence, and thus, two deterministic finite automata are extensionally equal if they accept and reject the same sequences, even if they look different. We of course cannot test all possible sequences, because there are an infinite number of sequences. However, thanks to an idea of Mihil and Nerode, we can try a different approach though. We will try to build a machine that minimizes a deterministic finite automata by merging any two states that are indistinguishable from each other. Two states are distinguishable if there exists a possible input sequence such that one of these states will be accepting and one will be rejecting. In other words, two states are distinguishable if and only if the two states are rejecting accepting or accepting rejecting or the states on their zero transitions are distinguishable or the states on their one transition are distinguishable. We can solve this recursively with a machine for each pair of states. First, we find out all states that are accepting and declare them distinguishable from the rejecting states. Next, we go over each pair and check if their direct zero transition pair or one transition pairs are distinguishable from each other. If not, we are done. If they are, those states will also be marked distinguishable and the process has to be repeated for all states. If two or more states are indistinguishable from each other after this recursion, they can be merged into one state. This will result in a deterministic finite automata with minimal states for this problem. Yes, we can now create a machine that decides whether two deterministic finite automata are extensionally equal by creating their minimal versions and checking if they are structurally equal. The minimal versions can be compared by their structure starting from their initial states and comparing their subsequent transition state by state. What this boils down to is basically saying, look at them, they are equivalent. This should bring us hope. Next, we will need to tackle the harder problem of how we can see if a formal map of a deterministic finite automata is equal to our preconceived notions of something. Chapter 6. Brouwer's Intuitionism. Previously, we made the distinction between the map and the territory. But since we want to check if our map is equal to that of a machine, we should be more precise by what we mean by a map. The demon cannot just trick our map completely, he has to trick certain parts of our mind. Brouwer had the deepest ideas of how our mind creates a map. Unfortunately, Brouwer is hard to read, mostly because his knowledge of the mind dates back to the early 20th century and is rooted in Kantian rhetoric and introspection. But let's hear from him. Mathematical contemplation arises in two phases as an act of the will in the service of the instinct for self-preservation of the individual man the phase of the temporal attitude and the phase of the causal attitude. The temporal attitude is nothing other than the intellectual ur-phenomenon of the falling apart of a life moment into two qualitatively distinct things. One senses the one thing as yielding to the other, while nevertheless being maintained in the act of memory. At the same time, the split life moment is separated from the eye and transferred to a world of its own to be designated as a world of perception. The temporal two-ness that has arisen through the temporal attitude or the two-member temporal appearance sequence can then itself be conceived as one of the members of a new two-ness, thereby creating the temporal three-ness, and so on. In this way, the temporal appearance sequence of arbitrary multiplicity arises by means of the self-unfolding of the intellectual or phenomenon. Did you get any of that? I'm going to give my non-introspective interpretation of this, which is rooted in Endel Tolving's model of memory. According to Brouwer, we are sequences of experiences in the territory with instinctive desires. 
At any given moment, the territory imprints a sense experience on us. If we focus on a particular experience, it becomes conscious and wanders into our short-term memory. Further, if the right motivation is present and encoding is easy, these memories are then stored into our episodic memory. Episodic memory can be thought of as stored sequences of experiences over time. If I ask you what you ate for dinner last Sunday, you could probably reconstruct it by thinking about what you did on Sunday and then slowly playing back the memories until you land at the dinner table. Try it right now. If it helps, take out your phone and look at the picture or messages of what you did that day to have an initial anchor. Brouwer calls these memories temporal sequences. The causal attitude then consists in the act of the will of identifying different temporal appearance sequences that extend over the past and the future. In this way, there arises a common substrate of these identified sequences to be called a causal sequence. A special case of the causal attitude is the mental formation of objects, i.e. of enduring simple or compound things of the world of perception. At the same time, the world of perception is itself stabilized in this way. Temporal sequences that are repeatedly processed such as the sequence of seeing green hairy stuff on the floor, smelling it in spring, touching it with the hands and tasting it will all be united as a causal sequence, grass. We construct the concept grass from these experiences and can answer what color is grass immediately without tracing a temporal sequence. This is semantic memory and is our favorite memory as it requires no particular effort. In a study by Wes Maciejewski, less understood mathematical concepts tended to be associated with more vivid episodic memories of a first encounter, whereas well understood concepts were less vivid, semantic. Similarly, we know that 7 plus 7 equals 14 through semantic memory, whereas 23,123 plus 3,123 equals 25,246 can be verified with a vivid sequence of the common addition sequence. Brouwer does not speak of the map and the territory when talking about mathematical contemplation. He cares more about whether it is possible to construct a sequence to reach a goal and how that sequence is constructed. For example, Brouwer has a craving for a burger. First, his semantic memory might tell him that he can get a burger from McDonald's. Second, His episodic memory might tell him the temporal sequence of when he last went there. He went there by getting his car keys and then driving in his neighborhood to McDonald's. He also remembers it to be less than $10. Third, his episodic memory then tells him the temporal sequence of where he last put his car keys. Fourth, his semantic memory tells him that his wallet is in his right pocket because he always puts it there. He uses his high school sequence of addition to calculate that the amount of cash he has is more than $10. From these sequences, Brouwer can create a new sequence that will result in his desired sequence through a sort of cut and paste reasoning, where he pastes the sequence of getting the car key into the sequence of getting the car key and then driving to McDonald's. Just like the squid constructs a sequence of movements for his tentacles to catch a prey, we humans construct a sequence of movements to get a burger. This construction is mathematical contemplation. Another way of saying this is that mathematical contemplation is more than merely a map deciding what is true. It is a search problem over sequences. Note that this is not a linguistic activity. However, we have a way of sharing these sequences with others by encoding them into natural language. I want to drive to McDonald's. Do you know where the car key is? The car key is on the white sofa. Maps are just a special part of these sequences. Specifically, we encode maps with the word is. The car key is on the white sofa. Language accompanies the mathematician, just as the weather map accompanies the atmospheric processes. The weather map does not, however, create the weather. It merely describes it. But how does this more elaborate explanation of a map help to protect us from demons? For this, we have to go to ancient India, to the only human the demons truly feared. To find out, please subscribe and leave a like because it helps the algorithm. Thank you.